Hello. We're going to discuss uh, Chapter 7, which is uh, the second law of thermodynamics. And these are the objectives for this chapter, and keep in mind always these objectives as you study for your exam. We'll introduce the second law of thermodynamics and identify valid processes that satisfy both first and second law of thermodynamics. We'll discuss thermal energy reservoirs, reversible and irreversible processes, see the engines, refrigerators, and heat pumps. We'll describe the Carnot cycle and also determine the expressions for the thermal efficiencies and coefficients of performance for reversible heat engines, heat pumps, and refrigerators. The one thing that I want you to um, understand is that we will talk all of most of these uh, principles. But the only calculation that will be really important for you to learn how to do are the thermal efficiencies. We'll talk about the coefficients of performance, and we will define what are those. But um, just focus your attention on problems related to thermal efficiencies. Here we have several uh, figures. And the first figure, we have a cup of hot coffee, and the hot coffee will release the heat into um, the cooler room. But the coffee will not get hotter in a cooler room. Cooler room. It'll get cooler. If I have this paddle wheel, and let's say that I'm uh, rotating the paddle wheel, the paddle wheel produces heat. But it doesn't matter how much heat I add here, that paddle wheel is not going to move. In this case, I have a uh, wire that generates electricity. And generally, the wire that generates electricity will get hot. So it will release heat. But if I do the reverse and try and add heat into that wire, it will not produce electricity. This processor processes cannot occur. But they're not in violation of the first law, the first law of the conservation of energy. So on paper, I could do calculations to um, transfer heat to a wire, to get a cup of coffee hotter, or to uh, transfer heat to a paddle wheel and make it work. But it doesn't happen. So processes occur in a certain direction and not in the reverse direction. The first law of thermodynamics talks about the quantity of energy and the transformations of energy, but does not talk about the quality nor the direction. The second law will be used to identify the direction of processes. So we'll introduce the second law in this chapter, but then we'll do some calculations on whether a, pro a process is possible or not in uh, chapter 8. But for now, know that the second law can be used to identify the direction of the processes, as well as to um, define how important quality is. So the quality is also very important, the quality of energy, because energy can be great. Major uses of the second law, as I mentioned already, the second law is used to identify the direction of the processes. And the second law also says that the quality of the energy, as well as the quantity, is important. So um, the quality is important because not all energies are equal. And during a process, the energy can be great. So any process must satisfy both the first and second law of thermodynamics. Later on, we will use entropy to help us detect violations of the second law. But for now, we'll talk about just direction and quality in this chapter. Let's define a very important concept, the thermal energy reservoir. And a thermal energy reservoir can be used as a source or as a sink. Whenever we talk about a thermal energy reservoir that's a source, what we're doing is uh, showing there's a source of energy of heat. So that heat will be released as a source. If we have a sink, what the sink does is that it absorbs the heat. So um, 
a source supplies energy in the form of heat, and a sink absorbs energy in the form of heat. Whenever in thermodynamics we talk about thermal energy reservoirs that are sinks, what we refer to are that these are relatively large masses. So our sinks of energy are mostly um, big thermal energy reservoirs that can be oceans, lakes, or rivers. So we will not uh, worry about changes in the thermal energy in this masses because they're so large that um, there's no significant change in those reservoirs. So here we have water and we have the shaft. So we add or apply work onto the system. The shaft rotates and heat can be produced as a result of this. So on the contrary, if I add heat to that water, I can get no work out of it. So this, again, displays how energy, or I should say work, can always be converted to heat directly and sometimes completely. But the reverse is not true. Heat cannot be converted to work directly and completely. It does not occur naturally. In order to convert heat to work, you would need what's called a heat engine. But not all the heat can be converted to work directly and completely. What happens is that we have a high temperature source, and here we have Q in the heat engine, and part of that heat will be converted to work, but part of it will be lost. So that heat that could not be converted to work is going to be rejected into a low temperature sink or a reservoir, like a thermal reservoir like we just defined. Let's talk about common features of a heat engine, and this will help define what a heat engine is as well. Heat engines receive heat from a high temperature source that can be solar or furnace, nuclear, and they convert part of these heat to work, usually in the form of a rotating shaft. And they reject the remaining waste heat to a low temperature sink, which is a thermal reservoir like atmospheres or rivers, and most importantly, they operate on a cycle. If you recall, in a cycle, and we can define this in different ways. We can have here um, temperature and pressure. And in a cycle, it goes from one point to another point. We can go in different directions and return. But what happens is we have point one and point two, started at point one, and ended at point one. So that's a cycle. And I just use this to uh, thermodynamic processes. For or parameters, but it can be anything. The important fact is that when you operate on a cycle, cycle you start at the same point, thermodynamically speaking, that you started. So heat engines are basically work-producing devices that operate in a thermodynamic cycle. The best example of a heat engine is a steam power plant. And in a steam power plant, there's it's an external combustion engine, meaning that the combustion occurs outside of the system. Because you're producing the steam using some external combustion, whether you are using, um, you know, boiling water with coal or nuclear or solar. And then that steam goes into what is the cycle to produce work. Engines that involve gas turbines and car engines do not operate on a thermodynamic cycle, but a mechanical cycle, because the combustion gases do not undergo a complete cycle. The combustion gases, remember, in a car, for example, are released when you get 
inflow of new air to help the combustion. So you have um, the um, air going in and out of the system. It's not a closed system. It's a mechanical system on a mechanical cycle. So it's not a thermodynamic cycle. Remember, in a thermodynamic cycle, you start and end in the same point. And in terms of the thermodynamic properties, like the basic properties we have discussed, pressure, temperature, enthalpy, all of those at the beginning and at the end will be the same. So heat engines and other cyclic devices usually involve a fluid to and from which heat is transferred while undergoing the cycle. This fluid is called the working fluid. So in a steam power plant, the working fluid is, is water or the gas, uh, steam. Um, in uh, an air conditioner system, you know, you have the refrigerant or freon would be the working fluid. So that fluid is the one that um, is undergoing the cycle itself. Just to give you an example of a steam power plant, what you have is that you are producing steam. You have a reactor vessel with some rods and then produce steam. And the steam uh, is what um, is used to provide mechanical energy to the turbines. And from the turbines, go to the generator. But that steam doesn't go out of the system like an external combustion system. So then it's condensed. And that condensed water that now is liquid will go back again. And you know, granted, sometimes there's losses of the steam. But you can see that there's a cycle. The water is recycled. And it's just changing phases. So it goes from liquid to steam. Um, and the steam is what will be used to produce the work. So you are um, heating up the water, and that water carries the heat. And the heat, um, when it's high enough, will be uh, when there's a phase change to steam, and so on and so forth. So this is just an example of um, a heat engine. Remember. In a heat engine, we have a heat temperature reservoir. So we have a TH, high temperature. And this temperature represents heat or energy in the form of heat, which is added to the heat engine. We produce a work net, but QL. There's a loss uh, in the heat input that will go into a low temperature reservoir, uh, PL. We will look at other examples in a little bit. So this brings us to a very important concept of thermal efficiency. Remember, I mentioned that the calculations for thermal efficiency are very important. and Thermal efficiency refers to the work out divided by the Q in. If we look back at this expression here, this is here the Q that goes in. That's what I'm adding into the system. And then I'm producing work. But not 100% of the energy that I put in in the form of Q is converted to work, some is lost as QL. So this is an example. You have a, some furnace to produce uh, heat. And let's say that you produce 100 um, megajoules of energy. Remember, this is energy in joules. And you produce here 55 megajoules of work. But then you lose 45 megajoules. So in this case, what you can see is that only 55 out of the 100 megajoules of energy that I provide are converted to work, and 45 are lost. 
So in this case, what I have is that 55 megajoules out of the 100 megajoules that I added. I should say 100 here. So the thermal efficiency then is 65 percent. This expression here, Q out minus Q in, is because um, if you have here, this is 45 uh, are lost. So this would be here we have the Q uh, in, and this is the Q out. The other way of seeing this is, and we're going to start with this part here. Um, so what's the net? Well, in this case, the Q in was 100 megajoules minus out is 45 megajoules. So I'm getting here the 55 megajoules of the net. Same thing as I have here, the net. So if I look at the efficiency, the thermal efficiency, and I say it's that the net work so is Q in minus Q out divided by Q in. Well, this is also 1 minus Q out over Q in, which is this expression here. So you should get the same number. And it's depending on the information that you have. Once again, this is a very important concept. A heat engine cannot be completed without rejecting some heat to a low temperature sink. Okay? Every heat engine must waste some energy by transferring to a low temperature reservoir. So in this case, I have 100 kilojoules of heat going in, and then I produced 15 kilojoules, and the heat out is 85 kilojoules. So you have a high temperature reservoir, that is the source, and you have a low temperature reservoir, that is the sink. Okay? So here we have the source, and here we have the sink. Whenever we talk about cycles, uh, remember, cycle, you start and end at the same point. What happens is that to go from um, point one to point two and back to point one, different things occur in the middle. So this is reviewing some of the cycles that can be happening whenever we say isobaric, means that it went, in this case, from point A to point B, and it's at the same pressure. When we say isometric, what we have is a specific volume. It goes from point A to point B, isometric. When we say isothermal, that means that there's no change in temperature. That doesn't mean that the Q going in and out of the system is zero. It means that there is no change in temperature in the system. But there could be other changes. And then adiabatic, what we have is that um, there is no exchange of Q in and out of the surroundings. This is what we mentioned in the class if we say something like, oh, the system is insulated. Okay? Doesn't mean that the change in temperature is not going to be zero, but means that there's no heat coming in and out of the system. So whenever we talk about the different cycles that um, have to um, happen for a heat engine or any type of engine that we'll discuss, then there could be, they'll say something like there's an isobaric change um, in temperature. That means that there was a change in temperature, but no change in pressure. Or if, if it says isometric. Or isothermal. So 
you'll see that in a moment, but I just wanted to refresh you on those concepts. So there's different types of cycles, and uh, for heat engines, we'll discuss the most important one, which is the Rankine. We will not discuss the one for gas power systems, the Brayton, and there's other cycles, um, the internal combustion engines, Auto, Diesel, Sterling, and Atkinson. If this was a mechanical engineering class, we would discuss it, but we just want to introduce you to what cycles are. And then, of course, we'll talk about refrigeration, heat pump, and air conditioning systems that are also cycles. So heat engines um, convert thermal energy to mechanical work, as we said. And working fluids are gases from liquids. There's some phase changes that occur, as I mentioned. Like in the steam engine, it goes from liquid to steam. Um, and the cycle that describes like a steam engine is the Rankine cycle. We'll talk about that. We will not talk about the regenerative cycle. And then for gas cycles, the working fluid is always gas. We'll talk about the Carnot cycle, and we'll explain what that is. Um, I will mention it briefly, but then there's what we call an idealized Carnot cycle as well that we will talk about. Rankine, the classical steam engine, is described by the Rankine cycle. Power plants, the working fluid is alternatively vaporized and condensed. Um, a steam boat will be like an example of, of what is done. And the, uh, here we have the thermal reservoir that acts as a, as a sink, as well as the excess steam that has to be released into the atmosphere. So we have here, in this case, most of the heat goes into the atmosphere. So in the basic ranking cycle, and then if you keep in mind the steam engine, you would have a boiler. So here you're adding some force of, of heat um, that is transferred to the working fluid. In this case, it's uh, water. And the water is boiled and uh, goes uh, changes spaces into steam. That steam um, makes the turbine rotate and produces work. And there's the negative. Remember that notation is that um, we have here work um, being produced. And then we have a condenser that then um, condenses the water from steam to from gas to liquid. And then that goes back into a pump and that back to the reservoir. So the cycle, the way that we would describe it in thermodynamic language, is that um, we have going from uh, point one to point three, we have an isobaric heat transfer, meaning that the pressure uh, remains constant. From point three to point four, there's an expansion of the gas. And it's called isentropic. And isentropic means that entropy is constant. Okay? And we'll talk about that a little later after this chapter. And in 4 to 5, then there's isobaric heat rejection. So what we do is now we condense the steam and convert it to liquid. But then it occurs at constant pressure. And then from this point, again, to the initial cycle, uh, start of the cycle, then it, there's again compression and it's isentropic, meaning the entropy is constant. You will see a bit um, more detailed description of those steps. Um, um, you, you can read them. There's a few things I just want to um, bring to your attention here that the 
liquid um, is heated to the saturation temperature, and this applies to the noise refrigeration system. So in this case, we're talking liquid. In the case of a refrigeration system like Freon, then it, that's what would be heated to the saturation temperature. But of course, you don't need as high temperatures um, as the case for water. So um, what we have is um, different cycles of compression and releasing of pressure that result in changes in temperature. I'll let you read that. Uh, I just want you to understand the general steps. Whenever we have nuclear and coal power plants, then what is used to um, produce a steam can be nuclear power or coal. And this just tells you that there's a lot of waste in the products used for, for coal and nuclear plants. And, and so um, this is the, the waste that produces enormous. So in the nuclear power plant, you can see that it's a very similar cycle to whenever we talk about the steam. So the pressurized water then um, is used to, to power um, the turbine. Let's focus uh, a little bit on the steam power plant. And we saw in general terms how it works, but let's talk about um, there's some work going into the pump that then it's like the electrical, you know, you have to uh, make that pump operate. Um, we have the energy source, the QN, and that is the boiler where the water is boiled and produces steam that um, operates the turbine and then you get work out. Then that fluid goes to the condenser. In the condenser, the steam condenses and returns to liquid form. And here we have the Q out. And then that liquid is pumped back to continue the cycle. So I want to point out that this Q out then is part of what is lost, not all the Q in that you add into the system can be converted to Q out. We talked about that the efficiency. So the question is, can we save Q out? Can we just not take the condenser out of the plant and not allow to waste that energy? Could we use it? Because those are big losses. The answer is no. Unfortunately, no. Without a heat rejection process in a condenser, the cycle cannot be completed. It will not be a cycle. So what we have is we cannot convert this added heat, 100 kilowatts, into 100 kilowatts of work. This is not possible. You cannot have Tl equal to zero. So in terms of reviewing what efficiency is, remember here this WN is the work for operating the pump, okay? And in this case we have QN, which was like the QH, as we mentioned in the schematic earlier. And then you have the work out, and this is your net work out. And what we call Q out here is the QL or low temperature. So high for H is for high temperature, L is for low temperature. Now, I want to point out a couple of things. Whenever we look at the system, it's a closed system because there's no mass going in and out of the system boundary. But if we were going to analyze each component of that system, like the condenser, then we analyze each one as an open system. If we were just to look at the condenser because there's mass, mass going in and out. Same for the boiler. There's mass going in and out. 
And same for the turbine, there's mass going in and out. But in terms of the system, how we're looking at this, no mass going in and out. So that would be analyzed as a closed system. And remember, the efficiency, the thermal efficiency is how much work I can get out of that heat that I add into the system. The Kelvin Black statement, which is part of the second law of thermodynamics, says that no heat engine can have a thermal efficiency of 100%. The working fluid must exchange heat with the environment as well as the furnace. This impossibility of having 100% efficient, efficient heat engine is due to, to friction or other dissipative effects, you know, um, within the machinery. Um, it is a limitation that applies to both the idealized and the actual heat engine. And what we're seeing now, like, for the actual heat engines that will calculate the thermal efficiency, and we'll see how that would be different from an idealized uh, heat engine. So, heat transfer occurs from high to low temperature without any device. From low to high temperature needs a device and it's a heat pump or a heat engine, I should say. So we'll look at this specific cases of refrigerators and heat pumps, which operate on similar ramping cycles. So in the case of refrigerators, you know, they're um, cyclic devices, but in the case of um, the working fluid is different, so we call that working fluid is the refrigerant. And again, um, it's again a vapor compression refrigeration cycle. We have compression and decompression. And this shows you a refrigeration cycle. Again, it's like um, a ranking cycle, just uh, using a different working fluid. And now we're talking about a different system because what we have here is that we want to reduce the temperature of a refrigerated space, okay? So we want to transfer the heat from the space into the, what we call the evaporator. So um, in the freezer compartment, that's where heat is absorbed by the refrigerant, uh, and that's the evaporator. The coils usually behind the, refri the refrigerator is where heat is dissipated to the kitchen air, and that um, would be the condenser. So there's got to be some losses as well. So what do we have in a refrigeration cycle? We have uh, some work going into the system, and this is the compressor, okay? What we're using the compressor for is to compress the refrigerant. Remember, in this case, we have a refrigerant like Freon. And by compressing this refrigerant, and this is an example, 800 kilopascal, we are increasing the temperature. Remember the case of the can of air? Whenever we release the pressure, the temperature is reduced. But if we were going to do the opposite and increase the pressure, the temperature increases rather than decrease. Okay. So what we have is this refrigerant has been compressed, the temperature has increased, so it goes through the condenser, and in the condenser, then it goes from um, this heat will be released UH, and that will be like in the back of the refrigerator. So now we have an isobaric process, meaning the pressure stays the same. So you have 800 kilopascals, but then here you have initially 60 degrees, and now it's 30 degrees. We have an expansion valve, the throttle valve that we talked about. And in this throttle valve, remember, we, what we do is release pressure. So now the pressure goes from 800 to 125. 
And in the release of this pressure, then you have a decrease, very high decrease in temperature. So we have minus 25 degrees Celsius. By having this evaporator, what we have then is that the heat that is in the refrigerated space will be transferred to the evaporator. Okay. It would be a small space, so the decrease in temperature in the refrigerant will not be significant because the pressure is high here. And then it goes back to the original space here with the compressor. So by reviewing this, what we have is the compressor compresses the refrigerant, so it will increase the pressure, the condenser will um, be used to dissipate part of that heat. The expansion valve releases the pressure, thus reducing the temperature of the refrigerant. The evaporator then absorbs the heat. for the refrigerated space, and then it goes back to the um, compressor. So we have basically four components here. We have the compressor, condenser, expansion valve, and evaporator. And you need to understand what each one does. Is. The compressor, the condenser, expansion valve. So that would be a really good um, multiple choice to um, for the exam. Hint, hint. So again, as I explained earlier, and this explanation is also in the book, check the state of freon after each state. So in the book, you can find for freon the same information that you found for water. So you have some tables in the book. So what I want you to do is to look at these properties here for freon and find out what is the state of the freon or the phase for each one of these conditions. Okay, so practice that because um, it's something that I could ask you to do. Here what I've done is uh, give you kind of the answer without looking at the tables necessarily, but it's a different, different um, um, figure. So whenever you have the compressor, it goes into vapor, the condenser, then it turns it into liquid, the expansion valve, then you have liquid and vapor, and then you have the warm air being fanned out, and this um, you have the evaporator that then cools the refrigerated space, and then now it's into vapor. So there was no change in temperature in the refrigerant here because there was absorption um, or release of energy. In, in the process. If we looked at the freon, whenever you look at the states for each one of those, what you will find is if you come to the um, specific entropy versus temperature, remember that there's some isoentropic um, phases where there's no change in entropy, so you have the saturated vapor goes to superheated, then saturated vapor, saturated liquid, and then a mixture of saturation, um, saturated liquid and vapor, and goes back to saturated vapor. So basically, um, looking at those um, states, then you can find out what's going on. And basically, by changing the pressure, um, we have induced changes in temperature, and thus phase changes in the vapor compression cycle for a surgery and for instance. Now, let's talk about heat pumps. The work supplied to a heat pump is used to extract energy from the cold outdoors and carry it into the warm outdoors. So what we want is to warm up a place. And not that there's a lot of energy in the cold outdoors, but there is some that then is used to uh, one the indoor. And in this case, we have work 
that goes into the cycle, and we have heat. Um, so the QH is what we're interested, in, and then we have the QL uh, from low outdoors. So we have the source of energy. In this case, is the low temperature um, reservoir, and the sink intentionally is the one indoors uh, for QH. So. Um, just make sure that you understand the difference, and going back to this, uh, versus a refrigeration system, we'll give it in a little bit, but uh, make sure you put those images back to side, and you'll see those. So, um, the objective of the refrigerator is to remove heat from the refrigerator space. So, we looked at the efficiency for the refrigeration system as um, different than what we call now the coefficient of performance. Okay. In the case of the coefficient of performance, we're looking at what is the desired output. And in the case of a refrigeration, then we have to remove heat from the refrigerator. Space. So the refrigerator space is the low temperature, that's why there's a low. And the required input in this case is the energy I have to put or provide to the refrigeration system, like the energy, electrical energy that I have to put. So the coefficient of performance is the desired output divided by the required input. So um, here we have it, and yes, here we have it in terms of uh, temperature. So the net work would be what is that change in energy, and you can also express it as this term here. Now, what I want you to know is the definition of the coefficient of performance, because it's based on the desired um, output. The coefficient of performance can be greater than one because we're looking at two different things. Here, we're looking at the power or electricity and then the energy that is being uh, removed in terms of heat from the space. So it's kind of like two different concepts. So you will find some instances where you have a coefficient of performance greater than one. If it's greater than one, then it's very efficient. In the case of a heat pump, the desired output is different. We want to maintain a heated space. So we want to maintain a QH here. Um, and the required input is the electricity, but this is just the same as for the refrigeration. So what's the required input? And then the coefficient of performance for heat pump the concept is the same, but then remember in the heat pump we want to heat, and in the case of the refrigeration system, then we look at QL, not QH, but it's the same. So let's talk about some standard ways that you can find um, when you buy heat pumps or air conditioners. Um, there's some ratings, and they call them the energy efficient. Uh, efficiency ratio, not ration, or the seasonal energy efficiency ratio. So whenever we talked about the seasonal um, energy efficiency ratio, it's this one, is this ratio of the total amount of heat removed uh, by an air conditioner or heat pump during normal cooling season in BPUs divided by the total amount of electricity consumed in watt hours. And the uh, energy efficiency ratio um, would be kind of an instantaneous value, uh, but it's instantaneous in, based on the steady operation of the system. So uh, one is seasonal and the other one is instantaneous, but based on the steady operation of the air conditioner or the heat pump. And the relationship between the coefficient of performance and the EDR is this value here. So there's a federal standard 
as to what is the energy efficiency ratios that you have to have for different units, the new units. Okay, so putting um, these uh, side to side, again, the efficiency, the thermal efficiency is not the same as the coefficient of performance. Whenever we're looking uh, at a heat engine, for instance, we, we want to uh, look at the efficiency in terms of work out based on whatever you put in. Uh, but the coefficient of performance refers to the desired QH divided by the net value. Okay. So we saw heat pumps and we saw refrigeration systems. So the only difference is the direction. Because if we have a different direction, what we have is, and let me go back to that slide of the refrigeration system. Here I have my refrigerated space, and here I have the surrounding medium, like the back of, of the refrigeration unit where the condensers are. So what happens is that if I want to warm up the place, then instead of having the evaporator on the space that I am interested, I would have to have the boiler. So you either put it backwards or reverse the direction so that then you have uh, a heated space. And that's what a heat pump does, just reverses the direction of flow so that now we have the um, condenser and the compressor uh, in different places. Or alternatively, you can, if you have a wall air conditioner, just put it backwards. Because then what you're doing is removing the um, cold air whenever you have it as an air conditioner, but backwards then you're releasing the hot air into the room. So some important notes. Um, most heat pumps in operation today have a professional performance uh, between two to three. Um, most heat pumps use cold outside air as a heat source in winter. Um, in cold climates, in very cold climates, of course, the efficiency drops considerably when temperatures are below the freezing point. In such cases where you have like real extreme uh, temperature drops, it'd be more efficient to use uh, geothermal or ground source uh, heat pumps that use the ground as a heated source. Um, such heat pumps are more expensive to install, but they're more efficient. And um, this is important. Remember, we talked about the quality of, of energy. Um, the coefficient performance of the refrigerator decreases with decreasing refrigeration temperatures. So you can be um, saving electricity by keeping, I mean, we talk about keeping it 72, 73, but uh, let's say that you want um, to uh, have it even lowered and have it at 68 or 69, your energy consumption will increase considerably at lower temperatures. Um, that's based on the coefficient of performance. Remember, it's a desire divided by the electric input in this case. So uh, the coefficient of performance decreasing means that um, you will have to spend more energy to um, induce that change in temperature that's a lot lower. So it's not economical to refrigerate to a lower temperature than it is needed. So um, you can have um, heat pumps, you know, um, heated by gas, solar, thermal, geothermal, so, but the process is the same. I have added some videos. I encourage you to watch all of these videos. In those videos, there's some descriptions of geothermal and how the cycles operate, and um, other information that is very, very important for you to understand what we have discussed. 
Now let's talk about reversible and irreversible processes because this is important to determine the efficiency of ideal cycles. Uh, remember that for uh, the actual real cycles, we talked about the thermal efficiency, but the efficiency of reversible processes is different. In the case of a reversible process, means that the process is reversed without any, leaving any trace on the surroundings. Uh, irreversible process, of course, is a process that cannot be reversed. So if you have a frictionless pendulum, when it goes and swings from one side to another, it's reversible. If you have an expansion of gas and it's the closest, then you can go back and forth as long as there's no much, not much friction. But reversible processes do not occur. All processes in nature are irreversible. So why are we interested in reversible processes? In terms, you know, we're talking thermodynamics. Well, because they are easy to analyze and they serve as idealized models, so theoretical limits uh, to which actual processes can be converted. So what we do whenever we calculate the efficiency of a reversible process what we're doing is, okay, this is an idealized process, assuming that there's no friction losses or things like that, and I know that my actual process, the efficiency of my actual process, cannot be larger than the efficiency of an idealized process. In other words, the efficiency of an irreversible process cannot be larger and the efficiency of a reversible process. And a reversible process is an ideal process. So the efficiency of a reversible process is always going to be larger than the efficiency of an actual process. Okay? I cannot have a process with an efficiency larger than the reversible, which is the idealized. So, um, reversible processes deliver the most and consume the least work. Remember, these irreversibilities include. Uh, friction and restraining expansion, mixing up two fluids, right? You cannot unmix them. Heat transfer across a finite temperature difference, electric resistance, inelastic deformation of solids, and chemical reactions. So, all of these, which are realities in our daily life, renders a process irreversible. You cannot take back all of the energy. So, um, Heat transfer through a temperature difference is irreversible because if I release heat, like from a soda can, I cannot put that back in. It's irreversible. In the case of uh, friction, like if I have compression, that friction, if I do a um, analysis of initial and final energy, being very detailed, I'm never going to be able to recover all that energy that I left in friction to go back to the initial state. And compression and expansion processes, again, are basically irreversible. In this case, you know, if I have an extreme expansion, I cannot put it back where it was. So processes in nature are irreversible. So real cycles, are irreversible systems. Now, let's talk about the Carnot principles. And, and, and I'm describing the Carnot cycle because then I'll talk about the idealized Carnot cycle, which is a reversible process, the idealized Carnot cycle. So we will use that as our um, measure of the maximum efficiency that a system can have or cannot surpass. The efficiency, that Carnot principle says, the efficiency 
of an irreversible heat engine is always less than the efficiency of a reversible one operating between the two same reservoirs. That's another way of saying what I just have said over and over again. The efficiencies of all reversible heat engines operating between the two reservoirs are the same. That's another principle, and we go in uh, mechanical engineering thermodynamics, which expand on that. But a violation of either one of these statements is a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. So, most efficient cycles are the reversible cycles. 100% reversible cycles do not exist, but we use some models in which actual heat engines and refrigerators can be compared. The best known reversible cycle is the Carnot cycle. And in the past, there have been some problems in the SE exam that ask for the efficiency of the Carnot cycle. So, the Carnot theorem, again, uh, no engine operating between two heat reservoirs can be more efficient than a Carnot engine operating between those two same reservoirs. And maybe those pictures are not very descriptive for you, but basically, um, in a Carnot theorem, you go back to the original, it's reversible, completely reversible. And the Carnot cycle is described as four reversible processes to isothermal, remember what I told you? And you have, if you have two isothermal, that means that you have two processes within that cycle that have uh, the same temperature, and then two adiabatic, that means that um, in adiabatic there's no transfer of heat between the system and its surroundings. That doesn't mean that there's no change in temperature. It just means that there's no exchange of heat with the surroundings. So, in the idealized Carnot cycle, so we have isothermal expansion, temperature constant, and then we have a reversible adiabatic expansion. Remember, there were two isothermal and two adiabatic, and so we expand. So what we do by this um, expansion is reduce the temperature. Remember how the rim of the can of air? And then this reversible isothermal compression. So we compress it without changing the temperature. And then reversible adiabatic compression. In adiabatic, there's no exchange in temperature with the ceramics, Q0. And then whenever we compress it, then we have an increase in temperature. So basically, that describes the Carnot cycle. And um, the efficiency of the Carnot cycle has to be calculated. And for that, uh, we use the temperatures. Now, let's review our concept of the efficiency thermal efficiency, which is here for actual um, machines. And then with the Carnot machine, this would be the efficiency. So in terms of the calculations that you're going to be doing, this slide is the most important slide, because I will ask you to do calculations of thermal efficiency as well as reversible efficiency. Now, remember this is temperature, but it's absolute temperature, okay? That means that you cannot use degrees centigrade or Fahrenheit. It's either Kelvin or Rankin. That's very important, because otherwise you will not get the right number. And then this will be sort of the threshold where you know that our actual machine cannot surpass that efficiency. Okay? So this is probably one of the most important slides. So what you'll do is do calculations of the efficiency of heat machines and then the efficiency of a reversible or Carnot heat engine. And so this here gives you the information that you need. So what you have is your efficiency has to be less than the efficiency of the reversible 
engine or the car nut. If it's equal, then you have a reversible heat engine, which uh, you can be closed but not equal. And then this here, the your efficiency or thermal efficiency larger than the car nut engine, impossible. So remember that all systems are irreversible. You can be very close to the reversible, but you cannot be larger. Okay. Whenever you see the coefficient of performance, and as I said, we're not going to do calculations on that. Uh, maybe I will ask you to do one, and, and but not uh, for the Carnot cycle. What you have is that if you have a coefficient of performance or reversible, then uh, the it has to be. Uh, the coefficient performance of your uh, refrigerator, for instance, has to be less than the coefficient performance for the reversible. Okay, here's the reversible, same concept. So if you have equal, it's a reversible refrigerator, and then this is an impossible refrigerator because just as in the thermal efficiency, you cannot have um, thermal efficiencies larger than the thermal efficiency is a reversible or kind of cycle. We mentioned the quality of energy and um, what happens is that uh, a measure of that quality of energy would be your efficiency. Also, we saw it with the coefficient of performance, not mathematically, but in words. And what we have here is how these temperatures change, and as you increase the temperature, your efficiency increases. So the higher the temperature of the thermal energy, the higher is its quality, because then the efficiency increases. At lower temperatures, you have lower efficiencies. So the lower the temperature of the thermal energy, the lower is its quality. So the fraction of work that can be converted to, or the fraction of heat that can be converted to work is very important. And the higher the energy, the fraction of heat that can be converted to work is higher. So the quality of energy at higher temperatures is higher as well. So all these slides are in your um, Blackboard uh, folder. And this is an example. A typical example for an exam or an essay problem um, to calculate the thermal efficiency of an engine and um, the efficiency of a Carnot engine, which really is an engine where you remove all the irreversibilities. Uh, here's another example for practice. Okay, just. Um, to calculate the coefficient of performance, this one calculation. And then here, this is an, a very important concept, and we'll mention a little bit in class, but how an evaporative cooling works. Um, that's a swamp cooler, and there's all these YouTube videos I want you to, to watch. I will try and, and produce one that summarizes the highlights for each one of these, because it's important that you understand how an evaporative cooling or swamp cooler works. However, most of these videos are made by um, manufacturers of swamp coolers. So they will talk to you about the wonders of swamp coolers and how more how energy efficient they are and all of that. But what they don't tell you is that swamp coolers use a lot, a lot of water. And the irony is that evaporative cooling systems or swamp coolers work best in the southwest, in the desert southwest, and yet that's where we have the least amount of water. So um, they're not as good to use as, as they want you to, to believe, because your water bill is high. Now, water is cheap, right, because you pay less for water than electricity, but the resource is more precious in the desert southwest. So um, in order to protect the environment, you have to do a, you know, a, a balance of 
use of water and use of energy. And Dr. Tarquin has done some work on this, and um, we can talk about that in, in class. And I'll let you know some of his findings by comparing uh, some coolers to refrigerated cooling systems that don't use water, which is half the uh, refrigerant. So I'm going to stop here. And there's other slides that are for your learning pressure, uh, pleasure. Um, I'm talking here about internal combustion. So those of us that um, are interested in how a car engine works and what are the cycles involved and what happens, um, you can look through these slides. And they're informational and interesting, but it will not be a part of what will be discussed in the exam or included in the exam. But just take a look at them, um, and maybe you'll learn something of value for the future. Anyway, thank you for getting to this point, and um, I will do another video for the following chapter. And the, what we'll discuss next is with entropy, and it will be a very short discussion on entropy, and that will complete the material for the exam number two. Have a great day. Bye.